again. So this is the second part of, of, this, of this interview with, with Horror. 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 Um Criticism is an act of love. I mean, there's two things, there's two aspects to that statement. The second thing is love. Love, yeah. of, love of who? Love of life. Hmm. Love of life. life love love of humanity? Well. Humanity, yes. Like, yes. You, you talked a little bit about being a humanist. You yes. Did that. But yes. Can you explain what, that, what you mean by that? Humanist is that I believe in people. You might want to explain. Mm. Oh yeah. means you make mistakes as a person, for example. And I think that's all right. That comes along with being human. You do mis make mistakes. And it's all right as long as you don't really uh, well, it's like the, the now you like criminals, if you do it on purpose, if you do something on purpose, you mean to do it. That's that's something you should be punished for. I agree on that. But sometimes people do mistakes, and that should be forgiven, because we all do that. Humanism is like, I don't want to believe in technology, just go along with technology and everything becomes, everybody becomes uh, alike. The variation of human life, we should respect it. It's all right. Uh, I mean, if you take a bus, why does the bus driver has to have to be uh, some stereotype? Why not a drag queen, for example, or a transgender person or something? I would love to live in cities like that, where I, I see and meet people, uh, the way people themselves thrive. You know, uh, understand? Um, I, d I don't like to go around judging people. I like to see this variation, to mm. live among them, and I feel better when I, 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 I'm not around people who are just honest. You seem to have a very simple approach to, the, the very straightforward and simple approach to the questions that, that, you, that you ask in your work. Yeah. Which I think, um, I wonder if that is, that, that that was a very strong a part of this. I mean, a part of the success of the Cutlery Revolution was the fact that there was a simplicity and a humanity in, in involved in the expression of the of the process. Well, when I'm doing things in in public, there's no double meaning in it. Mm. Uh, what I say is what I mean. And I remember in the Cutlery Revolution, I made mistakes, but. I apologized for them in public. I said, look, I made a mistake. I am sorry. I apologize. This is something you could never see politicians do. Yeah. Because it's, a, it's all right doing a mistake. There's nothing wrong with it. And this happened to me at least twice. Very serious mistakes. What sort of? Well, 
it wasn't really a mistake. <laughs> but still... A tactical error, man. Well, I said some things I shouldn't have said because once I was angry, mm. it was my spontaneous reaction. And really, I should have... Uh, there was a, a, I was called by a, a, the media. I was asked for an opinion. At the m very moment, I got some news from the politicians. I got furious. And then their phone rang and <laughs> it's like, and really, I, I should have like said, can you call me in 10 minutes? But I said some words that I regretted. Yes. But, and it upset everybody because it was broadcasted all over and over again for a whole day and it was just debated in the television that night and, and but nobody bothered to call me and ask me. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the day after we had a big meeting and the first thing I said to people look you've been debating what I said I apologize I should have said it differently but the meaning would have been the same so Mm, yeah, this is the way I work. I like to keep things very, very clear. So when um, so I'm, I'm I'm interested in two more two more questions in relation to right. your father. So, so when you came out and and you then you then set off on on your, I mean it was almost like a, I mean it's not really a pilgrimage, but it's like a tour of of transformation. I mean, I, I think that that's one of the most amazing things about your story, about, about going around the, the, the halls and talking to the people, which is what you're doing here in New Zealand to do now. It's the same, it's the same thing. It's the story of my life. I'm always talking to people. And telling stories about... Telling stories and sharing things, because I, I find the more, like when I'm a teacher in the theatre, I really enjoy it because I learn a lot. I'm really, sh I'm giving my experience and other people are sharing their experience. Uh, this is the, 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 uh, the form of like uh, developing or, you know, growing as a person. It's working with other people. Uh, I, I, I often think about this like I'm a teacher, I'm a professional man with experience and but I learn a lot from the students. But you must you must also be very self contained in order to be able to maintain composure. It would have been hard touring Iceland and being rejected in, in most of the places that you went. Well, yes, it was tough, yeah. But it was worth it because when I start thinking about a world that existed that people were just ignorant, totally ignorant. And it was so much hate. And if you work on this, talking to people, like I remember coming into villages and seeing mothers running out and grabbing their children. And I heard a lot of strange stories, but what I was doing, I was fighting prejudice. And how do you do that? You have to become, I mean, prejudice, it, it, the thing was like, people thought that gay people were ugly. They, they jumped on everything to have sex with it, especially children. I don't know, they, when I, I went around Iceland at time, year after year after year, I was always very polite. I didn't drink. I did smoke in those years, yes, but I quit. But I was just proving talent and proving that I was human. I wasn't this troll or whatever they thought I was. And neither were other people. And it's something, you know, I really didn't want to do this. But okay, I was in this position and I didn't run away from my responsibility.
Well, you chose to take on the responsibility yes. to, to change your society. Yes, because I saw people being thrown out of their homes and beaten up in the street, and I thought, if one gay person is attacked, I am attacked. I can't live with it. I mean, it is exactly, we are different personalities maybe and all that, but we have the same nature. And when one person was gay, attacked for being gay, I was attacked. And I had the ability to deal with it. You must, I mean, that must have been a struggle. And I mean, how, yes, did, how, did, how did your father see that? He must have, he must have been concerned for you. My parents were concerned, of course. But then again, they also knew me. <laughs> they didn't worry about me. Yeah. Not that, in that respect. My father really, when I was in exile and I lived in Copenhagen, and my father wrote me letters and uh, saying, come and stay with me, uh, build up your life again. And I said, I ha that yes, this is what I'm doing, but I cannot do it on your, your grounds. I have to do it on my own, the way I want to do it. And when I'm ready, I will come back to Iceland. So he supported me and, and my mother as well. Yes. So you went you went back to Ireland, I understand. Iceland. Iceland, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I keep confusing with it. You went back to Iceland in nineteen ninety one. One? Yes. And um, you you've looked but I mean, for the past seven or eight years you've been looking after your father, I understand. You've you've been to some extent look has, has that been part of your life? My father? Yeah. Yeah. I, I moved back to in 91 to be able uh, just to try if I could live in Iceland yeah. because uh, things were changing. Uh, actually, in, in the gay issue, uh, I established the, the gay movement in, in uh, 78 and the, the, uh, the people in the gay movement, they were very clever and hardworking people. And, they were doing victories, small victories here, there. And I was in Iceland working against the uh, for the while well, we had the AIDS uh, period. I spent a year, and I almost got broke because of that. I went to Iceland. I was working there, uh, trying to help that situation. And in eight in ninety one, I I, uh, I moved back. Decided to try. And it was fine. And then in '95 we got the internet, and that really helped a lot of things. Yeah. Among that, the the, uh, the but gay. But you don't use it very much yourself. Yes, I do use it a lot. I do use yeah. it a lot, but I'm I'm not very clever with it. Right. That's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> but mm, then yes, then uh, my father I stayed with my father the first year. He was living alone in a big flat. And then he, I was with him in 72 when he, uh, he stopped working. He was 73 at that time, if I remember, 73, four. And uh, then I was, uh, we had a very a close relationship. We spent a lot of time together, go out to the countryside walking and, and talking, and, you know. I lived in his home. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, I was always touring, and I got my own home, and I bought myself a little house. I think, I mean, I think that, that the relationship of a gay, a gay son to a father is one which which doesn't get talked up, talked about that much. But your your father, I mean, you say he didn't talk about it with you, but he just treated you completely normally. Yeah. Uh, you mean uh, treated me as a gay? <laughs> <laughs> no, as a, as, but as a, as a son, I mean, just he treated you the same as your your siblings. Of course. 
that you were what, you, what specific? That you were particularly close. Ah, yeah. we would just yes. Uh, we just had this relationship. Uh, I had a relationship with both my parents closer than my brothers and sisters mm. all the time. I remember when they were divorcing, I was like running around between them and, and talking to them. I mean, it was a quite difficult time for both of them and me too. But it always seems to be like emotionally relation, emotional relation on both sides. Uh, it was easier for me somehow to, uh, to talk to them. What about during the Cutlery Revolution? How did, how did your father, I mean your father was very old by then. Yes. And was he living he, with you? Or was he living no, no, he was in an elderly house. Mm. Uh, and uh, in 2004 I was living in London for a while and, and my father was getting sick so I just made a contract uh, deal with him. I promised him to move back to Iceland and take care of him until the end and I did and I saw him every day after that. He stayed with me for a while and until I got him a place in an elderly home and that was very close and we could see each other's window I uh, visited every day. Uh, I never, I traveled a lot, but I never stayed a, a longer than a week away. Because if I did, he started getting sick. That was just a fact. So yeah, I stayed a lot with him, and, and we spent a lot of time talking. Probably the the toughest uh, thing we did in recent years was accepting his death talking about it and, and accepting death in general, where where he was heading. And uh, Which for you is finality, and for him was it's finality. It's the yeah. same thing, yes. Mm. Uh, but still, at the same thing, we, we found it, both of us found it very difficult to talk about in the, the beginning. So we, we started talking about it, and then I just had to go home. It was too much. But little by little, and we were very honest about it. Uh, it was very necessary, and I feel that today I'm very happy that my father and I we, we spent a lot of time talking and facing that, uh, and also uh, learning uh, about all his life, his attitude in life, and, and where he came from. And he would die, and, and I would bury him, and I did. Uh, I held a ceremony uh, when he died, and he was cremated, and I held a ceremony where I told people for a, a, a little over an hour about his, his, the story of his life, because I knew it quite well, and I sang three of his favorite songs to honor him. And I had a friend of mine to play, I played the guitar, and a friend of mine played the, the mandolin and to honor my father because he played mandolin. So, I mean, today when I look back, I miss my father a lot, yes. But I am very happy to have uh, talked about all these things with him full honesty. When I was doing the Cutlery Revolution, he was getting sick, yes, but he followed what I was doing, and he supported me. He liked that. He was proud of you. Uh, very, very. He was very proud of me and his son. And I remember there were, uh, many years ago, there were, like, uh, journalists, uh, from a TV station talking to me. And I said, how about you coming? And I was going to visit Papa, so I said to him, how about coming with me? And they did, and my father was like, my son, <laughs> I am very proud of him. He did things that many people didn't dare to do, and I am proud of him, <laughs> like this. <laughs> it was very funny. 